like to get started today by uh, talking a little bit first about myself and my exposure to Zabbix. I started using uh, Zabbix about seven years ago. It was kind of an accident, a happy accident, that I got started with Zabbix. We were using the one of those competitors whose names we don't mention here, and it wasn't meeting our needs. And a simple Google search later, I found and deployed Zabbix, and here I am seven years later talking about it. Zabbix happened to be the very first open source project, not that I used, but contributed to. I, this is not to say that I contributed code, but I did sub, uh, submit bug reports in the early days, and I ended up helping a great deal uh, in the forums early on, helping others through the same kind of problems that I had encountered. Um, as a result of my, my work, I ended up working and supporting uh, Zabbix at uh, both startups and Fortune 500 companies. And so it's been kind of an interesting uh, journey for me. Um, you can find me in the IRC, uh, and you can email me if you have any questions about what we're talking about today. So what is Logstash? Logstash was created by Jordan Sassel in 2009. It was designed to make logs and log files more readable across the board. His uh, problem, and he was a, an engineer at Google, was that every single different program made different log files. They all had a timestamp and they all had data, but the way that that data came across was different and he wanted to be able to search across those in a meaningful way and that meant normalizing the data. And so Logstash was born as a way to normalize log data so that you could search across things and have identical timestamps and be able to correlate uh, events. He created this as an open source project uh, under the Apache license. Uh, and even though Logstash is now under the umbrella of the Elastic Company, it still is open source and it will always remain that way. It was, uh, it is a pipeline. It's not just a way for normalizing data, but it, you can think about it the same way that you would maybe piping an output through different, uh, different outputs or different things along the pipeline on your command line. But the three main pipeline uh, components that you need to understand are inputs, filters, and outputs. The only output we're going to be talking about today is the Zabbix output, but there are dozens of outputs, filters, and inputs that can help you to process and normalize your data. This is just a simple uh, sampling of the inputs available today. These are different ways that you can ingest data and be able to process it and, and do any number of different things with. Uh, this is a sampling of the different filters. Um, one of the things that makes Logstash a good fit for Zabbix is that there are certain things that the, the log processing engines that ship with Zabbix would have a hard time with. For example, if you have uh, your application logging big XML files, finding an individual entry in there with regular expressions could be quite tedious. But with the tools that Logstash provides, uh, for example, the XML filter, you would be able to parse those things down, find a single field, and then be able to send that field across to Zabbix where you could actually act on it and do something uh, that was useful for you. And this is a list of the outputs that we have available today. Uh, obviously, I've highlighted the Zabbix uh, output here. But as you can see, some of your competitors are in here as well. We didn't submit all of these uh, plugins. Some of them came from the community. The original Zabbix plugin was actually uh, based on the Zabbix sender binary. It made system calls. It was less efficient than having native TCP calls, and so it has been rewritten to be able to take care of that. Your basic Logstash configuration file looks something like this. It's kind of JSON-esque. It's not true JSON, but your, your different uh, components here, the input, filter, and output, need to be contained inside of curly braces. And you can have one or more plugins in each of these sections, and then you would define the settings for each of those plugins within there. Uh, to complete the uh, introduction today, there's a couple of filters in particular I'm going to be talking about as will be very useful for your Zabbix use cases. Um, specifically, uh, the first one we're going to talk about is called Grok. Um, but we're, let's uh, look at the file input here. This allows us to simply watch the output of a file like running tail. You can see what's going on in real time and be able to act on the, the file events as they stream past. Um, this is what a simple file input block would look like. 
uh, the path that you want to watch. And it can be as simple as that. There are a few other settings that you can uh, use if you're needing to read an entire file. There's a setting for that. Um, we have the documentation for all of these plugins on the Elastic website. Um, you can also listen as a server or be a client. Uh, you can set the TCP mode here, whether you're going to reach out and connect to a service or you're going to open a port and listen for requests from a service. And so that can be as simple as opening up uh, a port and an IP or a host name. There's also a clever way, and I put this example in here because it's unusual to show that uh, Logstash is quite extensible, that you can capture all or part of the discussion in one or more IRC channels and be able to act on input that comes through the IRC. For example, one of the tests that I will show today uh, I actually use the Zabbix channel. Uh, again, these are the, uh, the full list of inputs that are available here. So let's talk again about the filters. Now Grok, Grok was written as a way to reuse regular expressions. Has anybody heard of Grok before? Got a few users here, okay. So I don't need to go into too much detail here, but the idea was to make regular expressions reusable because a regular expression to parse an Apache log line, uh, even just the date section with all the possible answers, fills up an entire page by itself. And I wouldn't want to have to retype that every time. And so Grok uses kind of a token library to say HTTP date, and that will match what you would see on Apache log line, for example. You can use Grok to parse your unstructured log data into something that's structured, which is great for things like syslog, web servers, database logs, and pretty much anything that's easy for humans to read but harder for, for machines to understand. Right now, we come with 120 default patterns, but you can add your own rather trivially, and you can use one of these two URLs to help test the different Grok rules that you've created. For example, if I wanted to match this line, this is what my filter block would look like. And so I've got a grok filter inside the filter block. I'm going to say I want to, I don't think I've got enough juice in here. There it is. If I wanted to, I want to match. I'm going to match uh, the message field. When you send an event through the inputs, everything that comes in by default isn't stored in a message field unless there's something else that you've done to it. So we're going to match the entire message. And the first portion, which is right here, is going to be a uh, an IP type, and we're going to put that in field client. Then there's a space there, and then we're going to use, uh, we're going to put this, uh, a word here inside of the field method. Um, URI path param is to identify this portion of an HTTP log. We're going to put that in request. We've got a number here. We're going to put that in a field called bytes, and then another number here, which is a floating point number, we're going to put inside a field called duration. And so this automatically will match any line that matches this pattern as it goes by. If it fails to match, it will mark that with a tag that says grok parse failure, which you can use to, uh, to troubleshoot other things further. But again, this is what the output would look like. You will have it tokenized at that point as an object inside Logstash uh, delineated by fields and values. Uh, the neat thing about grok is that you can still use regular expressions on your own, of your own creation here. It uses the Oniguruma uh, format here. Uh, and you can even put your own Grok patterns together and define them yourselves. Uh, for example, this postfix QID uh, allows somebody to kind of create a regular expression that matches the QID inside the postfix log. So for this example, this is a little postfix example, you can see that we're just looking at this. It's kind of a syslog thing, but inside there, we've got this postfix QID. And so uh, with that QID here, it knows how to parse that, and it will become the ID QID here, as you can see. We also have a date filter. And the date filter is used to normalize dates. Um, this is one of the hardest parts of reading log files and trying to correlate things is that if they're not in a, a matching date format, you can't really do the correlation. So the date filter is designed to easily parse these things. It uses Joda, uh, if any of you are familiar with the Joda time library for, for Java. 
Um, for example, syslog events look like the April 17, and you can use the, the letters uh, symbols that Jodi uses to match this. Uh, when, by default, if you do not specify a target, the date filter will overwrite the uh, at timestamp field. When an event is created, Logstash assigns a timestamp, but what you want to do is take the timestamp that's in that event and overwrite that canonical timestamp so that the event has the same timestamp as your log entry, which is really useful if you're ingesting older data and you want to have it have the accurate timestamp. So let's presume that we have our Grok filter up above here. It's been removed for uh, space's sake here, but we've got this date match here. We're going to match a field that was inside there called timestamp. We're going to match it to this. And after the timestamp is done being matched, only on a successful conversion will this step be taken. It will remove timestamp because then it becomes redundant because you will have overwritten the at timestamp field, which is the canonical one for the event. And so this timestamp is simply redundant. We can remove it. Now I put the locale in here because We've got a lot of uh, Europeans here, and uh, those of us who are Americans are actually the minority. Um, you don't always have the same day names for or month names, and so you can actually define a locale here, and it will recognize the, the days and the months from what your locale is. Um, there are also some special pattern matches. If your date format is already in one of these, you can simply say match the date with one of these, ISO 8601. Unix will take float or integer values for Unix time. And then Unix MS is specifically for Unix time in milliseconds. And then there's the TIE 64 m Other interesting filters, uh, I can't talk about all of them, I don't have time for that, is the GeoIP filter. Has anybody used GeoIP before? Okay, got a good number here. GeoIP makes, uh, makes it really interesting because you can kind of do a reverse lookup on an IP address and know what country and even area code that an IP was in. This could be very interesting in a Zabbix term because you could say, hey, I don't expect a lot of traffic from China, for example, and or I want to be alerted if I'm getting a, a spike in traffic coming from a specific geographic area. The GeoIP filter, I simply point it to uh, I say this field has an IP address in it. This is as much as I need. I can remove and add some of the extra fields because there are quite a few that are provided by default, but the filter doesn't need to be any more complex than that. User agent. This is also uh, especially effective if you want to know where your users are coming from in your logs. Maybe you want to be able to create a pie chart that says, all right, what percentage of my users are using uh, Mozilla, which ones are using Internet Explorer, which ones are using um, Chrome. You can be able to parse out those things, find out which operating systems are being used. This built-in uh, pattern here, is, and you can extend it and add your own if you need to, helps to parse the user agent strings and to uh, tokens. And again, it can be as simple as this. And this is where I'm going to start introducing conditionals. We'll talk a little bit about more of them some more later. But this is as simple as it is. Now, this could yield an error if the user if this the user agent field does not appear. And so I can use a conditional that says, as long as the user agent field is not empty, then perform the user agent filter action on that. This is a by review here, this is a list of the filters that are currently available here. We only touched on GeoIP, Grok, uh, Date. Uh, there's uh, some other really interesting ones. Again, I mentioned the XML one earlier. Um, KV uh, is for key, key value pairs. Uh, there's oftentimes in log files where you'll get key colon value in a long string or key equals value in a long string. Well, you can use Grok to parse that out and make it into a field, and then you can use the, the KV filter to further tokenize those key value pairs and be able to put them into individual fields. So briefly mentioned conditionals. Much of the power of Logstash comes from being able to conditionally act on different uh, things. It's as simple as putting more uh, uh, bl code blocks in with if expression, else, if expression, and else. So these are the different kind of operators that you can use. 
fairly straightforward for anybody that's done any kind of uh, programmatic use here, but we can also do regular expression matching and unary operators with the bang uh, symbol there. So for example, what if I didn't want to include a certain field in the output? Maybe it was uh, somebody's login. Maybe I don't want to have a secret field in there. So if the field action is equal to login, we're going to use the mutate filter to remove the field called secret so that it doesn't make it through there. This is a useful way to be able to remove things conditionally or do other actions conditionally. For example, um, in the output block, I can say, hey, I've got these production errors uh, and I only want to send production level errors to Zabbix. And so we can look for the log level field here and say, if, there, if it is set to error, and if the deployment field is production, then we will actually act on what comes in there. Now, expressions can be very long and very complex and can continue on to, to do further things. In the interest of space, I didn't try to put the most complex examples in here. Now, you can do crazy things like this. The first line is, is a field inside of another field or the value of the field in the other field? Is the field inside of a string? Is the string inside of a field? Does the value of that field fit inside that array? Um, and then the last two, uh, the last, the fifth one, they're second from last, that should never exist. That's kind of a, uh, that's a, the idea that this one is uh, not going to fit there. And then the sixth one here is we can negate. And so, um, because foo does not exist in the list, hello and world, that will evaluate as true. And so, uh, because we're negating a false. So you can do very complex operations with expressions. Um, there's also what we call sprint f format, which is really just referencing string values or field values within a string rather. And so, for example, I can assign a field uh, we're going to add a field and we're going to call that field foo and we're going to put the value of field bar inside of field foo. But we can also extend this and create a new field called foo underscore. Uh, the value of bar would be the field name and then we can include the value included in field baz into that. And so it's not just add field that you can do this in. That was just uh, for the sake of example here. But you can do, you can reference your fields inside of strings with this. There's also the concept of nested strings uh, or nested fields where you've got objects. And so um, when you've got nested fields, you enclose each field name inside square braces. So the metadata field, and this is an important one for our examples today, the metadata field is a very new concept in Logstash. It came out with Logstash 1.5. And it is a field that you can use as a temporary workspace. None of the values in the metadata field will propagate out to any of the outputs. And so in this case, we're going to add a field into the metadata, into a subfield called bar, or we're going to add that value into the field foo, rather. And that's, you'll see why that's a useful thing here uh, as we go through the Zabbix examples. So uh, Zabbix, you know, it's, it's for monitoring. So if you wanted to uh, see where the code is for the, the Logstash output, uh, we've got a GitHub page for that. Um, there's also documentation. This is a community uh, plugin, which means that it is not officially uh, included with the Logstash distribution. It's getting quite large, and so we're trying to uh, make it easier to ship without it being 200 megabytes every time. Um, you can install the plugin by running bin plugin install and then the name of the, the plugin there. That's how it works for all of the other plugins. Um, now, it's important to note that the Zabbix output plugin is deterministic. You don't specify the item name as uh, what you're going to put in there, and I'll explain here shortly. Um, it's based on the Zabbix sender protocol. There's a Ruby gem that translates things into that protocol and then allows you to send it to a Zabbix server at a particular port. Um, it will translate that canonical timestamp into the, uh, sorry, epic time. 
I was trying to remember that, into the epic time that the Zabbix sender protocol and the Zabbix uh, server expects it to be in. And so when you are sending multiple values per event, um, it will make sure that the correct timestamp is included so that even if you're a little bit behind, when it gets into Zabbix, it will have the timestamp of when that event occurred. Um, the previous version, as I mentioned earlier, used the Zabbix sender binary, which was not a very efficient way of doing things. Um, but now it uses native TCP calls, so it's much faster. It does not currently support batching. So don't overload your trappers. Be careful, you don't want to send every single event if you're processing 4,000 events per second. That will, that will quickly overload things. Um, your options, you've got your Zabbix host uh, and key and value. And each of these three is deterministic. The value that you assign in here should be a field name in the event that you are trying to pull something from. You can't assign the item directly and there's a string because it will give you an error and say that field does not exist in the event. Um, the Zabbix server host and port should be fairly uh, straightforward and I will explain how the multi-value works. And timeout. Timeout is how long that Logstash will wait for the Zabbix server to respond. It's set to one second by default. You don't want to increase that very big unless you have a very, very limited number of items because it will cause back pressure on Logstash and can slow things down. Again, this is a string, but it should be the, the field name that holds the value you intend to send. Uh, same thing with Zabbix key, field name. Uh, and if you're using multi-value, this, if you populate this, it will be ignored. Otherwise, this is a required uh, thing there. And same thing with this. If you're using multi-value, then this you are absolutely required to uh, provide because this is what you're, you're going to send back. It's like the minus O flag uh, for the Zabbix sender binary. Um, this should be fairly straightforward. We're just going to identify which Zabbix server we're going to send things to. Now, multi-value. Um, is a newer addition to this plugin. It allows you to have multiple events or multiple fields and their values per event and send them each back in basically one batch there to Zabbix. And so it's an array where the first element must be the first key and the second element must be the, set of the value for that key. And it kind of iterates through that key one, value one, all the way down, however many uh, key value pairs that you have. And if any field referenced by any key or value does not exist, that entry will simply be ignored. Uh, I mentioned timeout already. I'm trying to press forward so that we'll have time to go through my examples. So this output here, we're basically going to send to our Zabbix server. It's going to use the default port if I don't specify a port here. And Inside my event, it's going to expect a field called host field, a field called key field, and a, a field called value field. In this case, we're also looking to see that there's a field called type, and that type is set to Zabbix. So we've got a conditional here that's going to uh, be deterministic before it acts on this. You can also use uh, tags. Tags are an array, and so you could say if Zabbix in tags, and it would use that as the conditional as well. And this is an example of the multi-field here. In this case, you would expect your event to have fields named K1, V1, K2, and V2. So let's go through a couple of use cases really quickly. Let's monitor the IRC for a catch word or phrase and send to Zabbix if that condition is matched. So we're going to have our input. We looked at this already. We've got our filter. In this case, I'm using a regular expression on the message. And so I'm going to check and make sure that the type is IRC, um, that our message includes the word all caps there, testing. And we're going to add some fields here. We're going to use that metadata subfield. We're going to have something called IRC key. And we're going to uh, create Zabbix host as well. And I've created a Zabbix host called IRC that I'm going to send in there. And that's stored in that Zabbix host. And then we're going to add a little tag uh, to this event. And we're going to call that testing. So what we're looking for is type IRC. And we're looking for testing in tags. And then what we're going to send is a single entry here to the key or to the value that is stored in this and the metadata subfield Zabbix host. Oops. 
And in this case, uh, metadata IRC key is going to be our Zabbix key, and we're going to send the entire message. And so this is a little screen capture from me testing this. Some of you who were in IRC probably saw me do this a couple weeks ago. But I just typed in testing one, two, three, and almost immediately, if you can see, this is kind of small. Uh, there's that last value that came through there into Zabbix. And if you notice uh, carefully here, the timestamp here with uh, 1824.26, 1824.26, the timestamps are identical there. Now let's look uh, briefly at some Nginx logs here. We're going to watch for error codes that are in the error range, anything 400 and above. And we're going to send to Zabbix when we get an error code. And for a bonus, maybe let's send the client IP that generated that, that code. So in this case, we're going to use the file input. We're going to tail the Nginx log. And we're going to label it as uh, something JSON here. Uh, in, so there's two different ways you can do this. You can use the JSON uh, filter. There's also a codec. I didn't have time to talk about that. So let's just pretend we, that we have mapped this. We're not going to use Grok. We, we sent the message in JSON format already. So with the JSON filter, it's pre-tokenized. I don't have to do anything. And so after we have tokenized the message field, we're going to remove it if it was successful. And now, if the type is Nginx JSON, we're going to, rem we're going to overwrite the host name because the host is the IP that it, this came from, which is only going to be localhost because we're looking at a file here. But inside this, this uh, log entry, we've got a vhost. And I actually want that to be the thing that I use in Zabbix is the vhost entry. And so I'm going to rem remove vhost, but I'm going to overwrite the host entry. Now, I've got my GeoIP. Uh, went through these things a little bit before. If the referrer field is just the dash, which sometimes it is, I don't want to keep it in there. So I'm going to remove that field. And now, let's do some magic here. We've got uh, if the status is greater than or equal to 400, and we're not looking at localhost, then we're going to add this metadata status key. And we're going to put in um, the value of field status. And we're going to put in the metadata here in the client IP key what the client IP was. And we're going to keep going here. And this is a little bit of a hack here. Um, Logstash doesn't like sending square braces by themselves immediately after this. It's a bug that we've already logged and we're working on. So in order to get past that, I had to put that comma in there. Um, but Zabbix doesn't care, and so that's how I got around that. But we're going to put the, uh, we're going to create this. This is the key that we're going to be sending. It's going to be error, square brackets, and then that status code, 400 plus, comma, and then the closing brace there. And then in order that we can do a simple count, we're going to send the value of 1 for doing counters. So Zabbix can uh, say how many times that we see this in this time period and just add up the 1s. So to kind of cruise through this, this is our output. And again, if the status is greater than or equal to 400, we're going to send this. And we've got to, we're going to send that counter number. And we're going to send the error code uh, key. And so this kind of table helps to show what's going on here. We've got our host, which is that vhost, which is untergeek.com. And then we've got our key inside of uh, Logstash looks like this. But this is what the Zabbix key looks like. And then the value that we send back looks like that. Um, on the other hand here, we've got this second output that's just going to send. Um, we're doing the multi-value here. We've got a status key and a client IP key. And we're going to just demonstrate what that looks like here. And so this is the result here. You can see that we have that client IP. Uh, and if you notice, we've got 21.42.13, and we've got 21.42.13. So we've got that uh, 4.99 there and 21.42.13. We've got the same event with three different lines there. Um, error code 4.99 in Nginx terms what meant that Nginx uh, closed the client before, or the client closed before Nginx could respond to it or, or something to that effect. And so we've got some 404s, 405s, 429s. Those are the, uh, the item keys that we built to capture that. And again here, um, I can go back through and then see what IP addresses came through. And the, if you note, the timestamps match and correlate exactly here. And I can see what was going on. Um, and again, the values will be at exactly the same timestamps as those others. And this is just the 404s here. So you've seen a really brief overview of some of the things that Logstash can do to enhance your Zabbix installation. 
If you'd like some more help in getting Logstash configured, please feel free to consult any one of these resources or look me up in the Zabbix channel. Um, thank you very much for Zabbix for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Hello, uh, can we uh, use LLD emulation in your example? So, uh, can we use what? LLD, low level discovery emulation. Can low level discovery, yeah. I actually did do that. I created a special script that went through the last hour's worth of results and said I had 404s, 400s, and basically created a low level discovery. I didn't have time to include okay, that can, in can here. Can you share this concept here? Yeah? Uh, can I share that concept? Yep, yep. So I basically I wrote a script that used the Elasticsearch API and went back through my log data that I had stored there and simply put uh, together low level discovery and said over the last hour I saw these, I saw this kind of entry. I saw 400s, 401s, 404s, 409s, 499s, 500s. It basically made a list of everything I'd seen in the last hour and then sent that through to low level discovery so that it would build the items for me. I am not speaking about Elasticsearch. Uh the part of Elasticsearch, only Logstash. Uh, with Logstash, I don't, I haven't written anything to do that. It would be a little bit trickier. For the examples I put together here, I used Elasticsearch, but it, it should be theoretically possible, but you'd probably have to write it, an extended plugin to do something like that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, um, could, could you tell me uh, where the host name uh, uh, did, did come from? Uh, Untajik in your example? It was in the log line. Um, when I was setting up Nginx, I did an, a JSON output uh, because you can specify that, and I included the vhost as a field name inside the, inside that JSON called, uh, and it was whatever the the virtual host was, and so I simply extracted that from. Uh, so, so the the host name uh, in the message uh, has to be exactly the same as in the Zabbix. So in, the, in this example, yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Sorry, maybe you told about it, I, I was late, but uh, what was the time that you kept the resources uh, in the uh, LLD role? What was the time? Uh, for keeping resources. Oh, how long do we keep these resources yeah. in Zabbix? That's up to you. I, I didn't talk about that. This but, was. Uh, I mean, if you put it to zero, then uh, the hosts are appearing and disappearing all the time. The, the LLD. Discovers uh, I didn't. I didn't remember what I'd set that uh, to. Okay. I think it was a thirty day. Oh, okay. Uh, so probably better to keep it more than zero. <laughs> right.